Legendary Passages, Episode 74, Sabel and Atlantis. Origin of the Gods, from Diodor Siculus, Library of History. Last time, we discussed the god Uranus and his children. This time we cover his sons Atlas and Cronus, and their various descendants. But first, a long aside on the goddess Sabel, born a princess, but abandoned in the countryside. She fell in love with Attis, but after her father found out, he had him killed. She wandered the countryside with her friend Marseus, who competed with Apollo in music and lost badly. Anyway, Atlas, son of Uranus, ruled Mount Atlas and the coastlines and made many discoveries in astrology. That is why he holds aloft the sphere of the earth and the sphere of heaven. He is most well known for his seven daughters, the mothers of many gods and heroes, who became the constellation Pleiades. Now Cronus was a mean and unjust man who married his sister Rhea and had a son named Zeus who was kind and just. Zeus overthrew his father and the Titans and became master of the world and ruled with virtue and goodness. Here ends our section on Atlantis for now. The next episode begins a whole new phase. Sabel and Atlantis A Legendary Passage From Diodorus Siculus, Library of History Translated by C. H. Oldfather However, an account is handed down also that this goddess was born in Phrygia. For the natives of that country have the following myth. In ancient times, Maon became the king of Phrygia and Lydia, and marrying Dindemi, he begat an infant daughter. But being unwilling to rear her, he exposed her on the mountain, which was called Sabellus. There, in accordance with some divine providence, both the leopard and some of the other especially ferocious wild beasts offered their nipples to the child, and so gave it nourishment. And some women who were tending the flocks in that place witnessed the happening, and being astonished at the strange event, took up the babe and called her Sibel after the name of the place. The child, as she grew up, excelled in both beauty and virtue, and also came to be admired for her intelligence. For she was the first to devise the pipes of many reeds, and to invent cymbals and kettle drums, with which to accompany the games and the dance. And in addition, she taught how to heal the sickness of both flocks and little children by means of rites of purification. In consequence, since the babes were saved from death by her spells and were generally taken up in her arms, her devotion to them and affection for them led all the people to speak of her as the mother of the mountain. The man who associated with her and loved her more than anyone else, they say, was Marseus the physician, who was admired for his intelligence and chastity and a proof of his intelligence they find in the fact that he imitated the sounds made by the pipes of many reeds and carried all its notes over into the flute. And as an indication of his chastity, they cite his abstinence from sexual pleasures until the day of his death. Now Sibel, the myth records, having arrived at full womanhood, came to love a certain native youth who was known as Attis, but at a later time received the appellation Pappus. With him she consorted secretly, and became with child, and at about the same time her parents recognized her as their child. Consequently she was brought up into the palace, and her father welcomed her at the outset under the impression that she was a virgin, but later, when he learned of her seduction, he put to death her nurses, and Addis as well, and cast their bodies forth to lie unburied. Whereupon Sibel, they say, because of her love for the youth, and grief over the nurses, became frenzied and rushed out of the palace into the countryside. And crying aloud and beating upon a kettle drum, she visited every country alone, with hair hanging free. And Marseus, out of pity for her plight, 
voluntarily followed her and accompanied her in her wanderings because of the love which he had formerly borne her. When they came to Dionysus in the city of Nyssa, they found there Apollo, who was being accorded high favor because of the lyre, which, they say, Hermes invented, though Apollo was the first to play it fittingly. And when Marseus strove with Apollo in a contest of skill, and the Nicaeans had been appointed judges, the first time Apollo played upon the lyre without accompanying it with his voice, while Marseus, striking upon his pipes, amazed the ears of his hearers by their strange music, and in their opinion far excelled, by reason of his melody, the first contestant. But since they had agreed to turn about in displaying their skill to the judges, Apollo, they say, added this second time his voice in harmony with the music of the lyre, whereby he gained greater approval than that which had formerly been accorded to the pipes. Marseus, however, was enraged, and tried to prove to the hearers that he was losing the contest in defiance of every principle of justice. For, he argued, it should be a comparison of skill and not of voice, and only by such a test was it possible to judge between the harmony and the music of the lyre and of the pipes. And furthermore, it was unjust that two skills should be compared in combination against but one. Apollo, however, as the myth relates, replied that he was in no sense taking any unfair advantage over the other. In fact, when Marseus blew into his pipes, he was doing almost the same thing as himself. Consequently, the rule should be made, either that they should both be accorded this equal privilege of combining their skills, or that neither of them should use his mouth in the contest, but should display his special skill by the use of only his hands. When the hearers decided that Apollo presented the more just argument, their skills were again compared. Marseus was defeated, and Apollo, who had become somewhat embittered by the quarrel, flayed the defeated man alive. But quickly repenting and being distressed at what he had done, he broke the strings of the lyre and destroyed the harmony of sounds which he had discovered. The harmony of the strings, however, was rediscovered when the muses added later the middle string, Linus the string struck with the forefinger, and Orpheus and Thamrius, the lowest string and the one next to it. And Apollo, they say, laid away both the lyre and the pipes as a votive offering in the cave of Dionysus, and becoming enamored of Cybele, joined in her wanderings as far as the land of the Hyperboreans. But, the myth goes on to say, a pestilence fell upon human beings throughout Phrygia, and the land ceased to bear fruit. And when the unfortunate people inquired of the god how they might rid themselves of their ills, he commanded them, it is said, to bury the body of Attis, and to honor Cybele as a goddess. Consequently, the physicians, since the body had disappeared in the course of time, made an image of the youth, before which they sang dirges, and by means of honors in keeping with his suffering, propitiated the wrath of him who had been wronged and these rites they continue to perform down to our own lifetime. As for Cybele, in ancient times they erected altars and performed sacrifices to her yearly, and later they built for her a costly temple in Persinus of Phrygia, and established honors and sacrifices of the greatest magnificence, Midas their king taking part in all these works out of his devotion to beauty, and beside the statue of the goddess they set up panthers and lions, since it was the common opinion that she had first been nursed by these animals. Such, then, are the myths which are told about Mother of the God, both among the Phrygians and by the Atlanteans who dwell on the coast of the ocean. After the death of Hyperion, the myth relates, the kingdom was divided among the sons of Uranus, the most renowned of whom were Atlas and Cronus. Of these sons, Atlas received as his part the regions on the coast of the ocean, and he not only gave the name of Atlanteans to his peoples, but likewise called the greatest mountain in the land, Atlas. They also say that he perfected the science of astrology, and was the first to publish to mankind the doctrine of the stars, and it was for this reason that the idea was held that the entire heavens were supported upon the shoulders of Atlas, the myth darkly hinting, in this way, at his discovery and description of the sphere. There were born to him a number of sons, one of whom was distinguished above the others for his piety, justice to his subjects, 
and love of mankind, his name being Hesperus. This king, having once climbed to the peak of Mount Atlas, was suddenly snatched away by mighty winds while he was making his observation of the stars, and was never seen again. And because of the virtuous life he had lived, and their pity for his sad fate, the multitudes accorded to him immortal honors, and called the brightest of the stars of heaven after him. Atlas, the myth goes on to relate, also had seven daughters, who as a group were called Atlantides after their father, but their individual names were Maia, Electra, Tegeti, Steropi, Merope, Halcyon, and the last Seleno. These daughters lay with the most renowned heroes and gods and thus became the first ancestors of the larger part of the race of human beings, giving birth to those who, because of their high achievements, came to be called gods and heroes. Maia, the eldest, for instance, lay with Zeus and bore Hermes, who was the discoverer of many things for the use of mankind. Similarly, the other Atlantides also gave birth to renowned children, who became the founders, in some instances, of nations, in other cases, of cities. Consequently, not only among certain barbarians, but among the Greeks as well, the great majority of the most ancient heroes traced their descent back to the Atlantides. These daughters were also distinguished for their chastity, and after their death, attained to immortal honor among men, by whom they were both enthroned in the heavens and endowed with the appellation of Pleiades. The Atlantides were also called nymphs, because the natives of the land addressed their women by the common appellation of nymph. Cronus, the brother of Atlas, the myth continues, who was a man notorious for his impiety and greed, married his sister Rhea, by whom he begat that Zeus who was later called the Olympian. But there had also been another Zeus, the brother of Uranus and a king of Crete, who, however, was far less famous than the Zeus who was born at a later time. Now the latter was king over the entire world, whereas the earlier Zeus, who was lord of the above-mentioned island, begat ten sons who were given the name of Curates, and the island he named after his wife Idaea, and on it he died and was buried, and the place which received his grave is pointed out to our day. The Cretans, however, have a myth which does not agree with the story given above, and we shall give a detailed account of it when we speak of Crete. Cronus, they say, was lord of Sicily and Libya, and Italy as well, and, in a word, established his kingdom over the regions to the west, and everywhere he occupied with garrisons the commanding hills and the strongholds of the regions, this being the reason why both throughout Sicily and the parts which incline towards the west Many of the lofty places are called to this day after him, Cronia. Zeus, however, the son of Cronus, emulated a manner of life the opposite of that led by his father, and since he showed himself honorable and friendly to all, the masses addressed him as father. As for his succession to the kingly power, some say that his father yielded it to him of his own accord, but others state that he was chosen as king by the masses because of the hatred they bore towards his father, and that when Cronus made war against him with the aid of the Titans, Zeus overcame him in battle, and on gaining supreme power visited all the inhabited world, conferring benefactions upon the race of men. He was preeminent also in bodily strength, and in all the other qualities of virtue, and for this reason quickly became master of the entire world and in general he showed all zeal to punish impious and wicked men, and to show kindness to the masses. In return for all this, after he had passed from among men, he was given the name of Zin, because he was the cause of right living among men, and those who had received his favors showed him honor by enthroning him in the heavens, all men eagerly acclaiming him as God and Lord forever of the whole universe. These, then, are in summary the facts regarding the teachings of the Atlanteans about the gods.